Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Deep Cuts Live. Um, today, I have a very special guest, which is Robert Holt from Southern Draw Cigars. So I've known of Southern Draw Cigars now for several years, but um, I've never really had the chance beyond an interview that I've done for different magazines here and there to really have a conversation with Robert. So I'm looking forward to learning more about Southern Draw Cigars and uh, see what Robert has to say, and let's bring him in. Robert Holt, how are you? Well, thank you for that gracious introduction, Antoine. I appreciate it. And again, I'm doing well. Again, I, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm better than I deserve. But, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I get to be the voice in the face of the entire Southern Draw family. So you're stuck with me. The audience is stuck with me. But the reality of it is uh, right behind me, there's a whole choir angel singing with us. So uh, so it'll uh, I'll try to I'll try to bring the words that they uh, would want me to share. How about that? Now, I remember. I don't know what year did you first launch? I don't want to see if this lines up with my memory. Yeah, um, 2013 we went to full production. February of 2014, almost to the day, 2014, uh, we put our first cigars into the retail locations. So that makes sense because I remember I was at the 2014. I was working with uh, Tobacconist Magazine and Cigars and Leisure when it just had just launched, and I remember you had, you had just launched. Because right. you sent samples of your cigars to uh, one of the salespeople that used to work at Specom. So I remember hearing a lot about Southern Draw. So it's funny to see, thankfully, that you outlasted many of the other brands that kind of just launched in, in that time period. I, uh, I, it, it is an honor, truly, to see what everybody's gone through in this in, in this industry. We've got we've got the peaks and valleys for sure, but no different than probably any other business. But I think the difference for us, honestly, is that our family truly believed in the mission uh, behind Southern Draw. Our partners in Nicaragua and elsewhere have, you know, given us uh, some liberties. Right? They they've really uh, created a buffer for us to avoid some pitfalls, and they've allowed us to grow and make our mistakes and they've done it again very graciously uh, without pointing the finger so we've been blessed with the with the family and the partnerships that we have so what i want to do today is really take people through how you got into the industry and then some of your experiences while you've been in the industry uh, i think for me personally it's working on the media side of the industry i think sometimes we you know the longer a company has been around we kind of lose touch with that what their origin story is and i think that origin story is kind of what makes you relatable to so many uh people and so many consumers out there who just are cigar fans because it makes your brand stand out from you know the one next to it in the humidor so that's a that's a that's a keen insight you just mentioned though uh how sometimes we lose track as brands progress and grow uh, and maybe it's just the schedules and the demands of life, but I think it's uh, unfortunate, right? Because I think uh, uh, for us, we remember where we came from. We remember who was there to share the message the first time with us and for us and on our behalf. And we don't look at the media any different than the consumers that buy our cigars. Everybody that buys and sells and promotes and shares the message is equally as important, but let's do our best uh, moving forward that we don't lose touch over time and forget about where we came from and the relationships that we had earlier Early on because I think um, even if it's just a perception Antoine it might may just be a perception even within our own family people feel like we're we change our priorities and we have not changed our priorities at all and that's just kind of an intro to what you said because I think it's a key point yeah so what how did you before cigars came about and of course southern draw came about I kind of know this the answer to this question but what did you do what was life like before southern draw <laughs> Well, I, uh, I pursued the brass ring, uh, like everybody else, I think, at my age. I, uh, uh, you know, I served uh, my, my eight years in the United States Army and uh, come from a pretty good lineage of uh, uh, volunteer military service. And uh, um, immediately following that, um, the year I met my wife, of course, it was 26 years ago, um, I finished my education in electrical engineering and communication, and I was an RF engineer and a, 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 and a uh, design engineer for some of the largest wireless companies uh, developing sites and or in and around the world. I mean, I think it took me to over 40 countries. So I spent 15 years in the corporate world 
and that evolved from the field engineering side into venture capital uh, investing, looking for ways to proliferate technology, i.e. Verizon Sprint, and the biggest probably of all of those was my years at Qualcomm, which obviously taught me a lot. Uh, what it taught me, though, it, I should have stayed there a little bit longer and I wouldn't have had to work, but, uh, but uh, think about it this way. When we talk about the basis of Southern Draw, I spent 17 years pursuing careers, pursuing um, wealth, big houses and big cars mm -hmm. and boats uh, and toys, why Sharon raised our children. And uh, people say, how did Southern Draw get started? We, we, it got started because we failed at something else. I made some very poor decisions uh, with our investments and our assets. And uh, basically, we went through a major fraud scam, you know, 2008, 2009, if you will. And um, we lost everything. And it was my wife and Sharon alone that made a decision that cigars were the right vehicle, that the friends and families and people that we've seen in the third world countries that we traveled to, i.e. Nicaragua, Honduras, Dominican Republic, Cuba, um, that uh, there was something we could do that would directly impact those people and we believed that this would be the right vehicle. So it was really her, her suggestion very firmly um, that Southern Draw would be um, a, a family brand that we would grow and the ultimate goal is just to uh, take care of those people that just need uh, the, the basic essentials of life and uh, that are willing to work hard to, uh, to achieve that. So it was kind of started very humbly. I'm always very interested in the idea of failure in business because it's something that doesn't get discussed a lot by many companies and people don't want to admit that maybe, you know, in the beginning or maybe at some point in their life, they didn't make the right decisions. But do you think you would have had the success with Southern Draw without those failures? Um, well, there wouldn't be a Southern draw without the failures, make no mistake, but allow me to be crystal clear about something else. I don't know that it was failures in the business and decisions, uh, that led to Southern draw as much as it was the power of prayer. And let me elaborate if I will, 17 years into a marriage that was kind of coming and going, falling apart, wasn't as strong, priorities weren't correct, my priorities weren't right. Um, but I grew up poor. I grew up with nothing. I grew up with hand-me-down clothes and holes in my clothes, and I was embarrassed to walk out into the world every day. And when I had a chance to make a difference and make money, um, maybe I didn't handle it right. But let me tell everybody a very simple but important fact. The day I came to, back to Austin, Texas to reveal to Sharon that we, quote-unquote, had lost everything, and she reminded me it was me that did it. When it was all said and done that day, she leaned across the table and she says, let me explain something to you. I've been praying to the good Lord for 17 years that you would lose all those opportunities and you would lose that big salary and you'd lose those big bonuses and those business cards with those big titles on it because I needed you to be humbled and get back to the priorities. So if you want a powerful message and if you want to not, not, not have to apologize for failure, um, it was the power of her prayer that put me on my knees that brought us to this. So, yes, did I learn from that without, without question? And I thought I turned off all my sounds, but that sounds like my warehouse sending shipping <laughs> notices. Praise God, right? Um, yeah. You know, here, here, here go the shipping notices, but that should be it. When, um, so after you all had this conversation and you came and she made the suggestion of moving forward with a cigar business, basically, what steps did you take to make that a reality? Because I know of so many people who smoke cigars and they always dream up the idea of having their own brand. And then they see the reality of it. That's not as easy, as easy as just right. getting a, you know, of having the idea and creating a cigar. Like there's so many different hidden steps that they don't do. Well, I think the comical part is, you know, at that point I had been smoking cigars for, for well over 20 years. And, uh, uh, I had been to many factories in many fields in many countries that produce both grow tobaccos and produce great cigars. I was really entrenched in that culture of art. And I say this a lot when I'm talking to folks, but you got to understand to me, it is an art form created by individuals that have a talent that I could never have. I can learn all I want to learn. I could be a great student, but I could never be the artist that they are, depending on what step in the process that they are, which brushstroke are they, you know? Um, but all those years in Central and South America and the Caribbean, there's not a country I didn't work in. 
I mean, I was embedded in the culture. I love the food. I love the music. I love the simplicity of life, and I love the struggle because I was familiar with the struggle. I didn't have to stand out, right? Uh, you didn't have to warn me not to wear jewelry in third world countries because I didn't own any, right? It was I was a simple guy. But all those years, I had a desire to uh, learn more about uh, the growing of these tobacco varieties, how the curing and the process and fermentation changes these characteristics and ultimately the blending. So I had a, a great um, education or base education by working for over a decade and learning and wanting to buy tobaccos for the purpose of let's, I mean, people go to the grocery store and they buy everything to make a nice salad for Sunday dinner. I was looking to at buying the tobaccos, learning the curing and the fermentation and, and just some general blending techniques that worked for my palate, something I would enjoy. So, you know, we didn't start from scratch. We started by sitting on in the exact chair I'm sitting on because this chair will fall apart in a number of years, but I love it because this is where Southern Draw started as a brand, not just a concept. I was smoking a cigar with no band, a sample of a blend that I had created. Um, and Sharon walked in behind me and she she just stood over me for a moment and and she took the cigar from over my shoulder and she just took it and she had smoked cigars with me since I had met her not a lot but she had smoked mm -hmm. and she said what's the difference Robert between that cigar and all the other cigars you've been smoking all the Cubans and Dominicans and Nicaragua really wasn't on the map yet and I said what do you mean she says it's so clean I, even my nose and my eyes and my skin and my, even my hands don't smell like burnt tobacco. They just smell floral and they smell great. I said the difference is proper curing, fermentation, and aging of the of the cigars. I said why do you ask? You know beyond that. And she says well what is that? And I said well, it's a it's a blend that I was working on and uh, it was just really something I was going to do for us and I was going to make fifty thousand of them to share with family and friends because I had a friend years ago that had made his own cigars and he used it for business and he shared it and it was really his and it was his personality and his character and she said no 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 you're not getting off that easy whatever that is <laughs> you and i are going to sell it 50 50 which in texas means 60 40 right she's in charge 60 <laughs> percent which is why i'm the man behind the boss lady but it was that moment that her that's been around me for all these years smoking cigars enjoying the culture going to shops buying from every shop she went to from getting on her little beach cruiser in Florida and going to a little cigar roller and bringing back a little baggie of cigars for Robert to enjoy. She knew what she was doing, but at that moment, that bloodhound in her came out and it said, that's something different, and I think that's something that I want to be involved in. And I was proud to tell her that was ours. Even before we started, it was ours. So that's how it started. It was her. And I've heard you talk in other interviews about the quality of cigars and the quality of tobacco that you use. Um, so that story makes me laugh because it's so true that sometimes you smoke a cigar and you just feel like it's, I don't know, like it's not as great as it could be. And I think the word clean is not something that a lot of people may, may associate with tobacco, but there is a difference sometimes if, you know, and maybe it's the quality of tobacco that you use that it can be, be either clean or like you said, it can really kind of, the smell sticks to you. It, right makes you feel like you just inhaled a whole ashtray. Um, just talk a little bit about the quality aspect. You really don't want to disparage anyone because you don't know what they have available to them or the process that they learned or, or, or how it's done, how many people or how much facilities, right? Cubans used to be the greatest in the world, and I would argue to say that they're probably the the, the lower quality of the major producing nations now. And I don't think it's because they have less of a passion or a culture or history or tradition. That's not true. I think it's the availability of a variety of tobaccos, facilities in which to properly ferment those and to sort those and to store those and to age those and to roll those. I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, now, that being said, we have a phenomenal partnership with A.J. Fernandez and have. And if it has a Southern Draw band on it, it is produced in Esteli, Nicaragua from A.J. Fernandez. So if you go back to learning about products, you know, again, we say, we, say we, 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 we look at the quality of the, the final product, but the process has been replicated over and over. And when we went to A.J., we only had two goals. No matter how small or how large our brand was, all we asked for was everything to be executed to our wishes, which the final result was 
make it consistent, and make it sustainable. We didn't want to invest in something that we didn't want to make in perpetuity and to grow the brands, right? We don't really do one-offs. We've done a couple of anniversary series, which were part of core lines, but we don't do one-off cigars. Um, there's always a plan, and we were honored to have, you know, we just, I just came back from Miami and meeting with AJ and Freddie and the team, and we talked about our first nine years together and how They've grown exponentially, but yet they've kept Southern Draw a priority because we've been honest and loyal and, and rigorous, and we've grown control, you know, in a controlled format, Antoine, that uh, has allowed us to honor them and what they do and how they do it for us. So the quality for us is, um, it is um, uh, it's quantifiable. We know the difference. And that doesn't mean everything that we blend or make is better than anybody else, but is it, it is exactly what we intended it to be. I can assure you that. We wouldn't put it out otherwise. We all have different palates. We like different characteristics of tobaccos. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just like the people and we like the brands. And, you know, we like more risque or we like more refined. And we like, you know, a different price point or a different shop. Not every shop sells every cigar. So all those factors come into play. But for us, I can assure you that our goal was to be consistent, sustainable, fair price and support various charities and our growth is important to us because that means we can do more and uh, our partners and our family have embraced that methodology and said whatever that is that is the reason that we're growing the way we are and the way we're received and accepted the quality comes from the priorities that we've placed on it and have you always worked with AJ Fernandez um, absolutely um, you know obviously I was exposed to a lot of factories and a lot of blenders and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, farm owners over the years, but it doesn't matter where our tobaccos come from. They're all going to be taken to us to lead to the factory. They're going to go through the same process uh, that has been established. And if anybody wants to argue that 10 years ago, um, you know, they didn't see the potential in AJ, um, that's, that's on them. But I can tell you, our family saw it. Our family believed it. We felt like he was the right partner. And when he asked us to do him one solid, and that solid was, if I do everything you ask, and you're satisfied and you're happy, and I make you a priority, please don't take your business somewhere else as you grow. Because he said, I know you're going to grow. But the flip side of that really is, we knew he was going to grow. We thought that maybe at some point, he, we could be replaced. Um, we don't have unlimited money. We can't pay exorbitant prices. We know what things cost. Wrapper, binder, filler, you know, we know what the uh, labor costs are. We understand the packaging costs down to the fractions of a cent. It's important to us because we don't, we don't go direct to consumer, right? The retailers make the bulk of, you know, the revenues on what we do. It's important for us to control the pricing. Uh, but uh, if we had chosen another partner at that point in time, you and I would not be on here today. Make no mistake about it. It was the only partner for us. It was the right choice, and it's just worked out, you know, for for all the right reasons, I think. And here we sit today, and, uh, you know, we're talking about moving past year 10 production with A.J. Fernandez, and we all know what's, what he's done to the industry in the last decade. It's been phenomenal. I mean, A.J. is one of those humongous figures in the industry that – probably doesn't get the credit that he should have, I think, in my, maybe my humble biased opinion, but to be working with him for so long, I mean, I think you know what he stands for, and I think uh, it shows him the quality of anything that he produces and he works on, so I know that if I were you, I wouldn't want to move or have any reason to move away from A.J. Fernandez either or his uh, production well, you're, you're sitting there in North Carolina. I'm sitting in Austin, Texas. And like I said, we, we can go back to our roots. And the term dance with the one that brung you has never been more important than this right there. It's, it's, it's about relationships, right? Um, what he stands for uh, is the same morals and values of what we stand for. And I say that in a way, we're in the people business. Our job is to do the best we can as we grow so we can provide food, shelter, clothing, education, and opportunity for the next generation of people in Nicaragua and the other tobacco producing regions that provide our tobaccos, right? So um, the fact that uh, he has grown the way he has but continues to take care of those people, my son said it best, you know, Antoine, years ago as he stood there, he goes, you know what I notice about this factory among many factories that we, he's been to, I've been to almost all of them, and he said, these people are happy, 
and the happy hands are going to make great cigars. And I thought, man, that's as simple as it, it's put. Because this comes down to a simple fact. If you want the best food in the world, sit down at your grandmother's table. Nobody can do it better. That's a fact. This is home cooking. Southern Draw is home cooking. If you're hungry, your stomach's rumbling, you're on the highway, pull into any number of the thousands of fast food chains, fill your stomach. If you've got six or eight friends and it's late at night and you're on the road and you're trying to get to your hotel and you're in Jersey, go to one of the diners. Great diners, great families. You're going to fill your stomach. But if you want real home cooking, you got to pay attention to the raw materials and how they're handled. And when you sit down, you know it's the best we can do with what we have because that's what Grandma taught us. And that means any grandmother. That don't mean just blood grandmothers. That's just in, in general, that generational pride and love of putting it into a product and then serving it up to other people. To, to backtrack a little bit, when it came time to name your company, how hard was it to, to settle on a name? Because I think when everybody starts a business, that's the first thing you think of. Like, am I going to call it you know, the Robert Holt Cigar or Holt Family Cigar Company or, or whatever. So what was that process like coming to Southern Draw? Well, two, two or three parts of this answer. First of all, there'll never be a Robert Holt Cigar. Um, I'm not that important to myself since I'm the one that uh, does the blending and the branding and the names. Every name of our cigar is, the, is uh, for a very influential person or group of people. The, the blends themselves are characteristics and personality driven of those particular people. It really does tell a story. Uh, number two, because there was a Holt family cigar there in Pennsylvania for 100 years, I never had to worry about using uh, Holt cigars because <laughs> we weren't going to get into that battle. But here's the truth of it. Southern Draw was the only name ever discussed uh, because I was sitting about 150 yards from where I'm sitting right now, more than... 14, 15 years ago, about 14 years ago. And I had a friend, a marketing hustler. You know, he's a smart dude, a great golfer. I'm a terrible golfer. We finished a round of golf, smoked a cigar, had a cold beer. And he said, Robert, you own a cigar brand. What's the name and why? It was that simple. And I sipped my IPA and I took my little Sharpie out. And I drew that band right there. And it said Southern Drawl. And I took that black sharpie and I put a line through the L. And I said, we're one part family, fellowship, and faith, potluck, you know. And we're one part focused on the science of the perfect cigar. Draw, burn rate, ignition rate, temperature, those things. So that's what we are. We're Southern Drawl. And it was never, ever a plan to launch the brand. But it was never discussed to be anything other than what we are. And it's always stuck. And I think the brand would be better in apparel anywhere in the South. We could make a lot of like make a lot of money as apparel brand versus cigar brand, right? But uh, yeah. uh, but that's the short answer. <laughs> the long answer is short. Uh, there was nothing else ever discussed. One of the things that I've always admired about Southern Draw and its marketing is that you always put faith and family and religion kind of at the forefront of everything that you all do. So talk a little bit about that, because I know that there's so many, maybe in like the MBA business school or whatever, they will tell you don't mix religion and business and, or the two don't sure. go sure. well together. But for you, you've made it work. And it's well, very and authentic I, to you all. And I would say outside of uh, televangelists, they're probably right. Uh, you know, you've got incredible uh, mega church right there in, in North Carolina and someone that my wife truly admires is his messages and that's a whole nother animal that was my second calling that I missed out on but you know for us I tried it the other way and it doesn't work and I, I was talking to it and an, an atheist associate friend you know social media friend but somebody that really supports the industry and mm -hmm. um, they made it very clear we don't really promote or talk a lot a lot about southern draw because all your bible verses and all that and i said i just said this you know five or six days ago i said you don't hold my faith against me and i won't hold your lack of faith against you and we'll just call it a day how about that because i'm i have a conviction not a belief i have an absolute conviction so if we want to know where that came from right there on that band whoops right there soli deo gloria glory to god alone it's there on the band for a reason my wife put it there to remind Robert Holt every day to keep my priorities straight. So you want to ask me why or how we can do it, how could we not? Without that, without that priority, without that 
that humble humbleness, you know, getting on your knees every day, Southern Draw wouldn't exist. So we're we're uh, we're firm in the faith. Um, we make mistakes like everybody else. We wish we uh, were were better each day, you know. But but for the most part, uh, in the DNA that we have, it is faith based. And I tell you, uh, we wouldn't try to accomplish what we're doing uh, without the power of the Lord behind us. And and it's put us in the right places at the right time to share that. And, uh, you know, consequently, we feed off a, a, a lot of that. You know, we haven't mentioned it, but when Miss, was, Miss uh, um, Mina passed earlier this week from Mina Cigar Lounge, Dinar, um, it, was a, it was a huge loss for us because it was one of those few people that we've come across in this industry that had the faith and the power and the ability to bring people together into an environment to make them feel welcome and loved and cared for. Uh, that could do it all with a snap of a finger, with few resources, but to provide that place. And it just reminded us that our mission is sound. It is strong and it's important and we're gonna stand our ground. And um, you know, uh, if that's our, if that is uh, something we get persecuted for later, then so be it. We'll not be unlike anybody for the last thousands of years. But for now, it's, uh, uh, it, we have lost opportunities. We have lost business. There are shops that don't care us. There are people that don't smoke us because of it. Make no mistake. That is, that has been impressed upon us, but that's okay. That is I'm okay. I'm surprised by that because the cigar industry seems, I would think the cigar industry would embrace a brand like yours. And it's, not, embrace the, it's, it's the, not the industry. Let's, let's not fault the industry. Like to say, there are people that are harmed or hurt or damaged uh, or trampled upon who felt left down, who felt alone, uh, that have uh, deep seated. Uh, issues that may never be resolved or may never be able to be counseled or discussed through and we don't fault people for having that there are people who lose loved ones like we lost this last week that question the lord right and they say why i mean when my brother died at 18 years old um the entire family just turned their back it was amazing to watch how quick we go from hallelujah on sunday to why 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 well let's quit asking why and i'll tell you uh over time we hope that our actions, what we do, don't judge us on what we say and what we put on our bands. Judge us by our actions if you want to judge us at all. And our 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 whole philosophy is spend as much time with people that buy and sell our cigars, people that we can impact, and you know get them together. This is a great vehicle to really show people loving, caring communities. And I think I I, I hate to say it, but you know over the the last nine years of Southern Draw, we've gone to church less because the churches have outgrown us. The message is not the same for us. This has become our new vehicle to fellowship and to socialize and to bring everybody, include everybody, right? Antoine, I don't think there's another product in the world that takes 300 different hands to make that everybody gets together and we get to burn the sacrifices and talk about what we believe. It's amazing. Yeah, and to, to go off of that, I, you know, like I said, I, I've read and watched other interviews that you've done and I remember getting press releases in the past from Southern Draw that talks about the 300 hands. And yet in the industry, you know, as I get other press releases about new products, like I spent all day today going through press releases, none of them ever mentioned <laughs> how many people made that, you know, it took to make that cigar. None of them talk about, you know, other than naming like where the factory is or whatever. Right. It's like we're, we're the industry is kind of, or a lot of companies, I should say, not the whole industry, but the industry knows the importance of those 300 hands, but that story isn't being told. And yet it seems to be at the center of Southern Draw. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad story in this sense, right? Because you just mentioned it. We know the factory owners. We know the master blenders. We know the godfathers, the kings and the queens of industry. We celebrate them every day and, and they've earned it, rightfully so. Um, I love the culture and tradition, but I'm more concerned about the people within the community. They might not even work in the factory or the fields or the box factory or packaging or quality control or logistics or uh, housekeeping or janitorial. They may not be even in that, but they're in the community that supports this industry. And you know what? They have names. They have families. They have needs. They have hobbies. They have challenges, they have a mission, they have desires to help people around them and it's okay for them to come to us and tell us, tell us what that is. And if we can do anything to expose 
that information to the multitudes and if our retail partners and our media partners and our customers want to buy 300 hands so that the proceeds can reach those people and make a difference I can tell you this there's only so much I can do but with the help of the media help of the retailers the help of the consumers we're all putting a couple of nickels in the bucket and it does make a difference and I, I think it's important we know who they are know them by name know them by name the same way you know the factory owners and the brand owners Right? That's what we should do. Let's strive to do that because they're equally as important and maybe more important because the future for them will only be dictated by our ability to continue to grow and succeed and, and give them more to do um, and give them stability. You know. Well, the 300 hands really is in the marketing world what you would call your unique selling proposition because it's what makes cigars different from any other tobacco product. You don't have, mm -hmm. there's there's not 300 hands making a, uh, a e-liquid. There's not 300 hands making uh, a cigarette. You know, there are 300 chemicals making a cigarette. Sure. Sure. <laughs> not I mean, 300 hands, but exactly. so I think, you know, that 300 hands and, and like you said, the focus on what happens in the factory and the, who those people are should be a story that's a little bit more prominent and told more often uh, if we want to really grow the the premium cigar category and get people to know what makes this product so special. Absolutely. I mean, your show is, or it's deep cuts, right? Think about mm -hmm. how deep one has to dive. We could watch um, the Summer Olympics and we can watch as the United States and Jamaica fight for the 4x100, 4x400 relay, right? And we'll know who these racers are because they're prominent, well-known, they're fast, they have all these wonderful records. What if the relay was 300 hands long? What if they had to keep going around that track? Would we remember all 300 of those racers or would we remember the guy that ran the anchor leg or the gal that ran the anchor leg? No. I'm telling you, the person in the middle of that process is as important as the one in the beginning and the one at the very end that puts that last piece of ribbon in the box when you shut it and seal it up, right? And it's our mission. If we can survive long enough and we can grow, I want to know every person and every step of the process for everything we do. And what we want to see is we want brands to go that are Dominican-produced brands and Honduran-produced brands and Cuban-produced brands and Peruvian and Costa Rican produced bands, we want them to do something very similar to recognize those people that have names, have families, have needs, and they're equally as important in my book. Now, you're talking about the charitable aspect of 300 Hands, and I know that some of your other releases also have had charitable kind of edges to them. So how do you develop, you know, a product where, because I know as a business person, you always are, uh, lots of business people are thinking about uh, profits and bottom lines and how to make that money back and how to make, you know, go above how much it costs you to make that product. So how do you develop kind of the charitable or social responsibility aspect of Southern Draw and balance that with it being a business? Well, we make very poor business decisions first because it does impact the margins. And then we apologize greatly to our family and then we huddle together and we drink a little bit and we smoke and we explain to them how vitally important to our mission and our and our brand that our charitable missions are and then as their charity of choice as the people that they look and feel and and hear and see in their communities when their needs start being coming addressed then they really understand what we're doing right and we're cycling through that so um we operate on a margin that is about 10% less than everybody else in the industry. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Where does that go? Go straight to charity. Um, and it comes from this fact that we truly believe in first fruits. And first fruits don't mean if I have something at the end of the year, I can give a few cigars away, give a little bit of money after you know Christmas is done. No, it means first fruits. It means we're producing cigars and packages with the sole purpose of providing quantifiable donations to specific charities. And yes, we do the military and first responders. We do some of the Native American indigenous with the Manzanita, the 300 hands, the Ignite series, uh, whether it was our Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, first responder charities. By the way, we're about to announce two or three new Ignite series charities that have been vetted. And each one of those are going to get their own unique product that tells their story. And it's not just a product, right? It's, it's something that was blended and branded and packaged specifically to support the charity. 
And then we ask the media to share that story. And then we ask the retailers, if you want to be first for something new from Southern Draw, bring this in, share the message so that your consumers can be the first one to get it at a good fair price. And we'll push with our media partners and social media and we'll explain to the world that what they're doing is contributing to this directly, not indirectly. But we have to basically take about a 10 to 12 percent less margin on our cigars. We have to bake that in and we have to explain that to our retailers that we're basically asking you to contribute half of it. You, we're contributing half, but you're contributing half. And then basically when, they're when their consumers buy from them, basically their half is now cut into 25%, right? Because the consumers are now buying their part. So think about it this way. We're all throwing a quarter or a nickel into the bucket, whatever it may be. And we're doing something that none of us would have and probably could have done on our own. I mean, what's, do you feel more, I think a lot of cigar companies do have some type of social responsibility or charitable aspect built into their business. So do you think even outside of cigars, like more businesses, do, should they publicize that or should they just kind of operate with that just being part of their business? Like, because I know some businesses might feel a little bit awkward make because they don't want people to think that, you know, they're they're publicizing it just to get good press. Like, how do you how do you <laughs> operate it without, you, you know, do it humbly, but it being a part of your business? Well, it, it's a phenomenal question, really it is, because I was just thinking about this earlier today. Um, we don't do it so we can write it off on our taxes at the end of the year. This is an LLC. Um, that's not what we do. Now, I cannot, for the life of me, know another man or woman's heart, so I wouldn't know what they do and why they do it. I've seen the richest people in the world give only enough so that offsets their taxes, but they still gave. Mm -hmm. So... Where it hurts us is we all pay taxes to contribute and, you know, the services that are rendered from that. We do our part. That's not the case for a lot of very wealthy people. They do just enough to offset, but they still give. So let me not question another person's intent or their heart. Our nature is not to, uh, to, to market it. It is to communicate it. And, and we want to do that because what we found out, Antoine, is not a huge percentage. We all know demographics are cigar smokers, but there's a lot of people that look within the community and they want to do some good. So by sharing the First Nations Development Institute or the 300 Hands or the Navy SEAL Foundation, um, you're able to go directly through those links and those relationships that we provide every time that we, we promote. And you can give directly and you can learn directly and you can share. So maybe it's not the cigar smokers or the cigar purveyors that we're only targeting, right? We want to share the message and make people aware. So I think awareness is the most important aspect of our charitable mission. We can only do so much. But we know for a fact that many of these donations have been direct to those charitable organizations, um, notwithstanding the sale of cigars. So I think the message is continue to share it in the hopes that you're going to reach the hearts of giving people that want to make a difference and they have the ability to do it. And this is going to be a, a bit of a tongue slash mind twister of a question, but what's something that you had to learn over the years in order to do your job better <laughs> <laughs> something i've had to learn um well i think i it, it, um kind of mentioned it earlier but i spent a lifetime of doing things on my own and uh holding myself accountable for the first time in my life when we started southern draw i had a partner and that partner wanted an equal say so so my type A personality had to be put to the side uh, because, as she said, one thing I know about you is you'll do it with the blinders on and you'll go charge the hill, but you're not paying attention. Even though I'm a very tactical person in my own mind, I wasn't. Um, but the, the most important lesson I've learned is keep your priorities straight. And my priorities weren't straight. I thought they were. They were straight for me, but they weren't correct. They weren't right, right? So I think the most important thing is when you have priorities and you set goals, stick to them, achieve them, right? Outside influences and outside feedback is vitally important. Pay attention to what people are telling you because perception is reality. Not, it's not a lie, they didn't deceive, they didn't cheat, they didn't hurt you. They had a perception that was different than yours and sometimes that's a very valuable tool, I think. So that's what I've had to learn. 
how has um, Sharon's role in the company evolved over the years? Because he's such an important part of Southern Draw. Like you don't think, you know, if you think Southern Draw, you think of yourself as being the, I think you call yourself the evangelist. But as you said, as your, uh, in your name intro here, as I read earlier, you know, she's the boss lady. Yeah, <laughs> so sure, her sure. role kind of changed over, or evolved over the years. Um, <laughs> the funny part about that is every year as we grow, Robert, I'm going to get some help this year. I need to step back. I've got other roles and responsibilities within the home and the community. I'm going to work less hours next year. So I think in 2021, we got her up to about 105 hours a week. So um, <laughs> she's been really cheap labor. Uh, she got her first raise ever in nine years um, in January. And, and I, I thought about it and I thought, well, it's a long time coming, but she didn't ask for it. Right. So but the company had to give her a raise because it, she does the job of 20 people. But here's the thing. How did, how did it change? It changed from her moving from the mother and the wife and the uh, philanthropic person that handled all of our, our things, commitments within the community to doing that for the company. So think about that. Now, her hand on customer service is the best I've seen. We don't, it doesn't matter whether we have reps or brokers and how good they are and how lovable they are and how friendly they are. The bottom line is the majority of our retail partners want to pick up the phone and call Sharon. Why? Because she's a very sweet, loving, caring. She wants to know about your family and your health and anything that you need versus getting an order. Now, that's not good for me, right? I want her to get that order, you know, let's see that thing processed. But how has it changed? It's changed that she's become that voice of reason and balance for Southern Draw and now if I had to change anything, because you're going to ask me that question, I can tell where your questions are going. If I had to change anything that I had done, any decision, Sharon would have been the face of the company early on. Sharon would have had the kind of the helm of the decision making because of how she interacts and what she does. And I would have stuck to blending and branding and doing what I do. Now, consequently, she's probably better at all that than I am too, but we don't know yet. But, but that means in the future, maybe I step back and that, you know, her or Ethan, Jacob step in and We'll see what their palettes uh, come up with, but but it's evolved because she's 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 the go-to person for everything. She's that balance that everybody's looking for, and I said it the other day. Um, she's that grace and humility that most of us, including myself, strive for every day, and that's how she represents this brand. And talk about your other family members. I think you have other family members that might be involved with Southern Draw, and it's like I said, it's a family company. Right. That's, that's correct. That's correct. You know, I'm I, I'm drinking my Beach House Winery wine here. That is Kim and George there in Fallbrook, California. Again, Southern Draw family, it, it, very close knit of folks that stepped in to help invest and to finance. I mean, it takes a lot to not just build the band, brand, but to grow the brand, to stay on the road 330, 340 days a year, spending as much time in shops and conventions and trade shows as possible. And, you know, they have to believe that we're doing the right thing for the brand. Uh, Ethan Jacob, Jacob's Ladder, most people know, you know, our son, 21 years old, you know, he's had a vital impact on this ba this brand and this company. He does have some serious health issues and challenges. Otherwise, he would be sitting here today because it was time for the new generation to take over this side of the business. Um, but, you know, we think, uh, you know, with 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 some uh, again, with some with some remedy and some of his health issues, we'll see Ethan here. But uh, I could go down a list of 17 family members that had invested time, money and resources from the beginning until where we are today that made this uh, all possible. Um, many of them would love to play an active role, operational role in the company. But the problem with that is um, one is geography, because this requires you to be on the road pretty much every day of the year. Um, and number two, um, I think it's, it's really, um, when it comes to the factory side or comes to the retail side, what's happened is those, those persons on the other end of the phone or the other end of the meeting have chosen and are used to interacting with Sherry and I. So it's really become a mandate that they only want to talk to us and do business with us. And it's not a knock on anyone else. It's just what they've learned. Mm -hmm. Now, when we only had 50 accounts. It was different than when we had 500 or now that we're over a thousand accounts worldwide, uh, but we still try to maintain that. So it's our hope 
that as we grow, we're going to have a more active role for our family members that are now retired or looking for something else to do because they're all chomping at the bit to contribute. And it's been a very tough road for us not to let them play an active role. But we also want to make sure that their livelihood's protected. Number one, we've got to protect their investment. But number two, what about their time and their resources? Antoine, how do we make sure that everything we're doing for the company is not taking away from the return they would get by spending more money on staff and resources? It's been a, it's been a tough challenge for me and even for Sharon to decide on adding staff and support because of what it would mean to the return uh, to the people that put the money in, which are all family. Right. It's kind of like a, a scaling issue. Like, mm -hmm. how do you grow? Like you said, keeping in mind that these other people have invested some of their time and efforts and money and resources into growing the brand. But at the same time, you're probably thinking as a business owner, you know, if we brought in a person to help to do this, you know, free up time and we could even maybe grow even more. <laughs> But then it's then it's you know you got to quantify it right and maybe mm -hmm. maybe maybe you make the wrong decision to do it, I don't know I guess it's it's been one of those things I've seen you mentioned this earlier I've seen brands come and go in the industry I've seen very few that have actually grown over the last decade they've 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 spread out and then disappeared come back a few years later God bless them I know it's tough, um, but uh, what I would say is don't ever hire or to divest yourself of responsibility of something that you can do. Do the heavy lifting yourself. Be in the struggle, carry the burden, until there's, it's almost unbearable. And then I think an opportunity will come up where that help is there and it's available. And I've fought that from day one and I continue to fight it. Sharon fights it, she's far overworked. Uh, but I'm so concerned that what if we bring them in and they give up what else they're doing and all of a sudden we've cost them that opportunity or that path that they already forged, right? And it's it's concerning to me because we know we're here by the grace of God and I don't know what the plan is tomorrow. I don't know what it is next year. We just hope we're going to continue. But I, I, I fear having other people risk what we've risked. And uh, I wouldn't be able to live with myself, I don't think. You know, if... Uh, if happen that because we brought him into southern draw to do something you know so it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough uh, um, scenario i think at this point yeah and i think like you said i'm in your philosophy as well like try to do as much as you can <laughs> on your own even though that workload just completely sometimes is crushing but at least you know the quality you know the product you know how you want things to run um and i guess it's just a matter of figuring out at what point to kind of let go of certain things or to delegate certain sure. tasks to somebody else. But that takes trust and trust is hard in business. It's, it's just a hard thing in, in business to have that trust to it, it, let it go. Is. It, it is. And it's, it's a, it's a key point, but we don't have an issue with trust with any of the people in the family. That's, that's certainly not it, but think about it this way. You know, when you, when you make an investment, let's go to the NFL. You have a couple of great years, you get rewarded with a big contract, and all of a sudden you start looking at production and it's going down. Was that a good investment or a bad investment? And I would say it's a bad investment. You never want to compensate at the peak so that people are comfortable. And I'm saying this in a very simple way. If you're in the struggle every day, you'll do more. You'll work harder. You'll work longer. You'll be productive because you're in the struggle. The moment you're too comfortable is the moment, I think, when the quality of your contributions decline. And uh, if I get to that point where I feel that we're that comfortable, it's time for me to step down at that point. There's some, it's time for our son or somebody else to take the helm. But there's gonna be opportunities if we continue to grow. But we wanna make sure that those are sound opportunities where people aren't really risking um, uh, what we risk and what we continue to risk every day. Because if you've been in this business this long, you realize that um, every quarter, you could go bankrupt, right? I mean, literally everything yeah. goes into the raw materials production. You, we've got to plan 12, 18 months out right now. And uh, you've got to get out there and sell it then, right? I mean, you really got to go out. COVID be damned, right? You've got to go and you've got to do it no matter what happens because nobody wants to hear excuses. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, opportunities will rise in the next couple of years that allow us to add some help. And more importantly, as you mentioned, uh, get Sharon some assistance, you know, kind of left hand and right hand to help her out. She's got a, a couple of helpers right now that have been kind of quiet about it, but uh, we'll see. 
from her wisdom, we'll see how how and where we go from here. <laughs> well, ha um, in terms of how have you handled like bringing on new retailers to your brand? Because I think I read a press release a, a while back, or maybe saw a comment that you were on another podcast and you were saying like, you know, you just don't want to bring on any any retailer to to carry Southern Draw. Like, you want to kind of control how big you all get like how have you approached kind of expanding the distribution expanding how many stores southern draw is actually in and and that was a paraphrase of what i said but really what i said was this um the retailers that we have are the most important ones to us um so their growth and getting their sales reports quarterly annual reports looking at how they're expanding to our different SKUs and and promotions and events and how that affects about 85 percent of our annual production even with our growth goes to our current retailers the truth of it is i would love every retailer uh, that has morality and integrity to carry southern draw that'd be great my goal from day one sounds odd it's a it's a subway sandwich commercial i wanted <laughs> every retailer to be able to have our cigars so that any consumer that wanted Southern Draw could be within 30 minutes of their own home, get Southern Draw. Now, the retail market allows for that in the U.S. for the most part, uh, but we don't make enough cigars to support all of our current retailers. So the risk in adding new retailers and filling those holes right now really is the risk of growth with our current retailers. And I don't think that's fair. Um, so we struggle. And what I did is I pulled myself out of that discussion and that decision. So now when those new retailers submit a request, <clears throat> Sharon, Ethan Jacob, and Alex Nungri, though they look at the map, they look at where we're at and what we're doing. They look at the growth of our, our, our market in those geographic areas and they try to they try to communicate that. Right now we're not opening accounts or maybe yes we can open an account, but this is what we can offer you for today. Um, so they try to stick within my production forecasting tools and how I do it because I manage all the production. So we want everybody to have it, you know, within within reasons, within Sharon's rules. Um, but uh, uh, but we're not going to risk our current relationships to go pursue new ones. And and even some of our retailers would say, well, that's not true. You know, you did this and that. Well, again, you don't know another man's heart and his intent. Our intent is to do the right thing, but we're not impervious to mistakes either. Um, Sometimes, you said it earlier today, even in the media world, something new comes along, we forget about the other brands. I'm big on loyalty, and I'm big on, you know, if you're moving my space down a little bit to bring something new and fresh in, that's your prerogative, that's your priority. But don't expect the same amount of love from me if I'm getting pushed down to the end of the line because um, I, t I have pride. I'm a grown man, and I have pride. It's, it's a sin, and I know it, but I have it. But uh, if you've embraced the brand and support the brand, obviously we're going to give you a lot of love. But if that love is waning, you know, just let us know. But we realize there's a lot of brands and a lot of, you know, cigars in the world to be, to be shared. But we just ask for a fair shot. So hopefully um, with our continued growth, we'll, we'll continue to be able to add some new accounts each year and fill some of these holes that we obviously have. Now, how do you define success? I feel like that's a good kind of segue. <laughs> ah, define success. Well, uh, you know, for us, here we'll go back to faith. We already have success. We have salvation. We have eternity, and I think that is wonderful. So from then on, every day it is um, let's, uh, let's do everything we can within our communities and neighborhoods to help in any way we can without endangering our own safety and our own lives because we have some obligations to our family too. But, you know, that's success to me. I mean, the fact that we have the priorities, Antoine, that we have, that is success. Um, we get offers to buy the company. We get offers to merge the company. We get offers to grow the company. And right now, those none of those have worked out because it is about the mission first. Um, but uh, uh, if our members... Um, get a return on what they've invested and what they've risked. Uh, and we can continue to grow the brand even after that. And there's a little dividend each year and we can take care of our retailers and our charities and we can continue to contribute to them. I tell you, by, by my definition, that's a, that's, a, that's a success that I never thought I would achieve. Um, and the more we grow and the larger we get and the more accessible income we have, there's more charities that we want to support. So if we can be held accountable by our charities and our family and friends, 
our partners and we can meet those obligations that we have to them, I think we're successful. And another question off of that is how would you define faith? Um, well, you know, faith by definition is believing in something for which you may not have all the physical proof for, right? But as a guy who mitered in Old Testament theology, I understand it more. So I've kind of moved away from the faith to um, a very simple analogy, which is I referenced earlier, which is everybody in the world has a belief. And a lot of those beliefs are based on their surroundings, their environment, their parents and grandparents and their neighborhood, their experiences. But there's only a select few that have convictions and the convictions mean you know it emphatically it's been proven it's undeniable you're unshakable in it so if you're unshakable that is taking faith to another level so I'm moving away from the term faith and I'm saying we have conviction and uh, we know people have beliefs but we we ask people that have belief to go find the proof put it to a test and make sure that you're willing to stake your life and the life of your family on it. And at that moment, then you'll have a conviction. So right now, faith has now evolved to, uh, for us into a conviction and to what we stand for, what we do, and how we do it. And we're convicted that that is what we must do. And here it is, February 22nd, 2022. It's a magical day. It's 2-2. Two, two, two. <laughs> and a Tuesday. So it's a magical faith kind of day of, of things. Somebody comes to you, Robert, and they say, Robert, you know, you have this business of your own. Obviously, you've been around for a good decade in this industry. You have success. I want to start my own business. What advice do you give that person who wants to start a business or they're an entrepreneur? Maybe they work, you know, a regular nine to five job uh, up until this point and they kind of want to go out and do something on their own. What kind of advice do you give that kind of entrepreneur or person? <laughs> That's a great question. I think it comes down to what's the goal? You know, what is the goal? Why would you do this? Is this a goal because you want to spend more time with your family? Is this because um, your health is failing? Is this because you have financial security and you're looking to do something that you've always enjoyed and dream about? I think understanding why someone's doing it is more important than what they're trying to do. So my advice is to really get grounded into the why. Why are you wanting to do that? And what are the consequences of that decision? Because risks are everything, Antoine. I mean, they are. So you really need to learn risk assessment before you ever jump into any endeavor again, because this world is full of thieves and cons and scams and ways to take away your security. And I'll tell you, if you have security and your family's secure and your community's secure and, you're, and you feel comfortable, why risk it? Why risk it? If it's a passion, great, but don't risk the things that keep your family safe and healthy and sane, right? Um, if you're trying to cure cancer, right? It's a great, great moral reason you're doing it, but don't risk. Uh, it's people used to say you'd go to Vegas or you go to, you know, you'd buy a lottery ticket. This was for entertainment only. Gambling is not for entertainment only. It's for a quick buck that you're not willing to earn on your own. And I'm going to tell you, entrepreneurship is gambling. Make sure you're not losing the focus on your stability and your health and that of the people that depend on you first. And everything else is secondary. Why do you want to do it? My advice is for them to really define why they would want to do that before they decide, you know, to move forward. And I think understanding the why is so important that, like I said, in business, so many businesses and they launch products without realizing what that why is for them and why that, what the why is for their business. Uh, and they get confused. They think the why is just profit. And that's not always, to me, that's rarely the, you know, that's rarely the, the answer to why. That's correct. It, and it's, it's, it, and it's rarely going to be a successful, um, a successful, uh, uh, end result or exit, if you will. I think why is important because if we learn nothing else through our lifetimes, the why is the most important because we could have saved ourselves a lot of heartaches and a lot of hardships mm -hmm. for ourselves and other people had we answered that question before we ever just pursued whatever that hope or dream or desire. And a lot of times it's just desire. A lot of times it's pride. You know, let's not let those things get in the way. Let's make sure that the why is defined. Exactly. So as we come to the close of our hour together, I want people to know, I know that there's some people who are going to be listening to this uh, just audio-wise, so they're not going to see the screen, but uh, 
can you share with us how people can follow up with you all with Southern Draw and keep up with what you're doing, your website, your Instagram, whatever other information you think is uh, important for people to get immersed in the world of Southern Draw? Absolutely. I appreciate that opportunity. Number one, for those that are listening to the audio, God bless you, because I do have a face made for radio. So that's the perfect place to get this <laughs> message. Um, number two, southerndrawcigars.com is our website. Not only does it have our mission and our vision, but it will go through uh, the the products, uh, the charitable missions, and it allows some of those direct you know donations and, and, and messages behind the charities that we do. Uh, Instagram and Facebook, uh, SD Cigars, SD, Southern Draw Cigars on Instagram, uh, Southern Draw Cigars on Facebook, and SD Cigars on Twitter. And what's important about that is, Antoine, we are very active, we're very positive daily, we interact with our retailers and our media, our own family. Uh, again, we celebrate together, we mourn together. This week has been a week of mourning. Uh, you can reach out to me. Unfortunately, I do handle all the social media for the company. Uh, so if you message me, direct message me, email me, uh, uh, you know, send me a text. At the end of the day, I will get to it. We try to respond. We do respond to about 3,000 comments, requests, and posts a day. So, wow. And, and usually that's between like the hours of midnight and 2 or 3. But um, if you have any questions, and if you want to become a retailer and you want to be considered, just click on that southerndrawcigars.com. Click on retailer. Become a retailer. It's very simple. You provide your permit, basic information. That immediately will go to Sharon, Ethan, and Alex to assess where you are, what you're doing. They're going to reach out to you in either way, and they're going to make it a very simple process. And again, we're you know we're we're uh, we're appreciative. We want you to to join us if you think it's right for you. If you want a little home cook and Southern draw is probably a good uh, choice for you. And at the end of the day, if you have a charity within your community that we might be able to help out, you can feel free to send that as well. There's contact information right there on the website. Well, I want to thank you again, Robert, for coming on today and spending this hour with us. We definitely went deep, so <laughs> it was a great tie-in to the name of this whole podcast and uh, interview series, Deep Cuts. So thank you so much for opening up and sharing everything that you did. I'm sure that there's a lot that you said that's going to resonate with people who listen and watch this in playback mode. I, it was our honor. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I, I appreciate my family allowing me to be the, the face and the voice today on your show. But anytime, uh, I don't know where we're going to run each other out uh, in the Carolinas or where it may be, but uh, we're going to try to try to get back on the road here pretty soon. And we'll we'll be doing a good number of events and fellowships out uh, out in your neck of the woods. So you reach out if you need anything. I noticed you weren't smoking today, and is that, that probably was my fault. Maybe maybe you asked, and maybe I missed that. So um, if you want to pick a couple of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of your viewers or listeners and you want to send me a couple of addresses, I'm going to have Miss Sharon send them the Peccadillo's Pack, and okay. this will allow them to try the new base blends. Scanning that QR code on the side will let them get involved in the new Peccadillo's Project, and ultimately the winner will be joining our family in uh, Nicaragua with AJ Fernandez and we're going to blend a new cigar uh, that is going to be decided by that winner so if you'll pick a couple of winners there you shoot me those addresses including your own and uh, we'll make sure everybody's uh, uh, informed and part of that great project. I will definitely do that I'll follow up with the email about that when I send you the uh, link to this playback um, so thank you so much for that offer and I just want to thank everyone for watching today and for listening to this whenever it is that you're watch, watching and listening to this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we try to do uh, at least a show a week. Lately, we've been doing two shows uh, every week, so it's a lot, but uh, hopefully you all find this informative. Uh, for those of you who have not watched before, you can go to deepcutslive.com where we have all the past shows and we'll be updating it with some of the shows that we've done this month. Um, we have another show on Thursday so you can join us at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time for that show. And um, I want if whatever platform you're watching this on, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, just make sure you hit that like button or the follow button to be notified of any time that we post new content or have new interviews going on. So, again, I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank Robert for joining us today. And I look forward to uh, having you all back here on Thursday um, for more Deep Cuts. So thank you so much.